morning. You know, this is this is the first Sunday in December, and uh, we haven't hit inclement weather yet. Praise the Lord. And uh, somebody said it's coming, but I hope not. You know, not right now. Not on the weekend. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather get out of work than get out of church? Amen. This morning, I, I want to do more of an academic sermon. And uh, maybe you've heard some of this before. But every every year, this kind of builds. And we, we devote, well, we devote the whole year to Jesus. But especially in December, it's all about Jesus. Amen. Morgan said he's the center of, him, center of it all. He's the center of it all. And so um, I'm, going, I'm going to title this message Ancestry.God. All right? All right. Has anybody ever checked their ancestry? Anybody? Y'all don't even care, do you? You know, I think it's, I think it's interesting. And um, I'm just going to share just a brief part of my name, Morgan. Uh, this does not deal with my mother's side or the American Indian side. It, it's just uh, the Morgans that migrated from England to Charleston, South Carolina, later settled near Little River and Cane Creek in Oconee County. Thomas, which is my brother Luke's name, Thomas Luke, and Ruthie had five boys and three, go three girls. And I think that stuff is interesting because that's pretty common in my family to have a lot of boys and a few girls I'm part of four and one, four boys and one girl. At the outbreak of the war between the states, Civil War, the four oldest sons, James Matterson, my great-great-grandfather, Matterson, uh, Morgan, John, William, and David answered the call for volunteers and enlisted in Captain Miles Norton's company. I'm just going to scroll down here. The Battle of Gaines Mill was a battle that ended so tragically for the quartet of brothers. John, William, and David were wounded by Union bullets. On June 27th, 1862, and guess what? If you look, checked yours out, it might have been your, your relatives that shot mine. So John and David were killed, and William was wounded. Soldiers detailed to bring in the wounded and bury the dead found John and David together in the same cornrow. Decent burial was out, out of the question, so they were wrapped in one blanket and placed in a long trench with hundreds of other boys. The hard clay earth covered them from the world forever. James Matterson, my great-great-grandfather, found his brother William wounded, took him to a hospital. He later died inside of one of the Confederate tents. And James Matterson was taken uh, under General Lee's army as a soldier of war, uh, a prisoner of war, and uh, released after the war, and I think somewhere down here. He, he was returned and released after Lee surrendered, faithful. Um, no, that's not what I want to say. Um, he was given a purple heart from the sons of the Confederacy. Uh, you know, when you look at your history, you can be on the right side or the wrong side of history, you know. And evidently, of course, uh, we were on the wrong side of history as far as uh, where that war went, but that was a civil war. That was us fighting us, uh, you know. And and you look back over history and you realize that there are, there are things in your life uh, that have been from your ancestry, from your genealogy, from your line, your lineage, uh, things that are noble, things that are ignoble, things that are honorable, things that are dishonorable. It's in all of us. Am I correct? It's in all of it. Nobody has a perfect pedigree. But I want to talk to you this morning about the pedigree of Jesus Christ because it's one of my favorite topics. And, and I know you probably know that, but man, if you can't talk about Jesus, I mean, yeah, somebody said, really? I mean, it's all about Jesus, amen? And, and it doesn't matter what you know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it matters what you know right here on earth, but... This will soon be over, and uh, none of that knowledge will matter. The only knowledge that will matter will, will be your relationship with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. 
But in Matthew chapter 1, we're going to look in two different places, Luke 3 and Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 gives in detail the lineage of Jesus. And, and for lack of time, I'm not going to read all of this, but the first Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 said, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It starts with Abraham and tells us the lineage of Jesus all the way to verse 17. And it tells us how these were broken up into three divisions, okay? Matthew 1, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon, captivity, were 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now, the Bible says things, but it doesn't say anything that doesn't mean something, okay? It, it doesn't just talk for talk's sake. So he divides these into three sections of 14 generations, and you add those together, and of course you get, what is it, 42. 14, 14, 14. 42 generations are detailed right here. Uh, 42 is, is a prophetic number. I'm going to deal with a few numbers today. Uh, 42 is a prophetic number. 14 is a prophetic number. Of course, it's double sevens. But it's a prophetic number in that, the, according to the Hebrews, their numbers had, had, uh, had a value, uh, a, a letter value. Whereas we're not like that. We have letters, you know, 27 letters in our alphabet. And then we have numbers. But their numbers, actually numerical value, have a, a letter value. So 14 is actually the word David. So we see that again, David, David, David. And that is messianic. That's the prophecy. The son of David uh, would be the Christ, the Messiah. And then 42, I know you know these two numbers, okay? Number six, okay? Six is the number of, what does the Bible say? Man, the number of man. So the Antichrist will be 666. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of what? Completion, perfection, God. Seven is a God. God number, okay? Six and seven. Six times seven is what? Forty-two, okay. Forty-two. So six times seven, man and God. This is called the incarnation, where man and God come together, the incarnation. Uh, the theological term is this. It's a hypostatic union. You might say, I don't care about that stuff, but this is really important. Hypostatic union or hypostasis means that God came to earth. And I say it like this, the Son of God became a son of man. So sons of men could become what? Sons of God. That's the hypostatic union where that in, in one person, one human, but also divine, carrying two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man. Jesus Christ, the Bible called him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That he came to us for us, and he lived this life that we live. Now, if you read this genealogy, you understand that in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy we are reading is the legal lineage of Jesus. This is the law. Hebrew, the Hebrews, you know, the Jewish people were all about the law. And this is the law. So according to the law from Abraham, it shows how that Jesus is in the legal lineage uh, of Abraham and of David and all of these messianic prophecies that he would have to be. So this is the legal father. His name is what? The legal father? Somebody help me. I hope I'm not boring you. But if I am, it's okay because this is my, my service. I love this service I love this one. You know, I'll get you excited next week. I love this one because it's so deep about what Jesus did for us. Okay, the legal father is Joseph. He is not the biological father. Okay? So to put it in terms, you might understand if Maury Povich were here opening an envelope, he would say, Joseph, you are not the father. Okay, that's the legal, legal 
lineage. Now, interesting, in this legal lineage, in most lineages and lines that you see in the Bible, genealogies, you do not see women. But in this of Jesus, there are four women. Four women. And it, I think it's important to know who they are. It's also important to know who wasn't in that list. Because there are four matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, uh, Leah, uh, you know, these, these three, three matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, were not in it. They were excluded, but the ones that were included were women like Tamar. Tamar. Tamar, who played the prostitute. She's there. She's there. You know, you know, you know what moral highbrow is? Where you say a name and you just got, yeah, that's the moral highbrow where you're looking. Here's the way they do it in the South. Um, they say, you know, Tamar. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Tell somebody right now to say, I'm not going to say anything. Because that's the way they do. That's the way they say something in the South. You know, I'm not going to gossip. You know, have you seen Nancy? I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. You know, but, but that's what that is. Okay, Tamar is a prostitute. Okay, moral highbrow. The other one is Rahab. What is she? Prostitute. We got a trend going here. Next one is Ruth, who is not a Jew. She is a Moabite. In other words, it, it, it is showing us that these, man can't choose who God's going to use. Man can never figure it out who God's going to use and how God's going to bless. Okay? So Ruth is the Moabite, and then it names this other lady and doesn't even give her name in Matthew. Doesn't even give her name. It says she was the wife of Uriah. You know who that was, don't you? I'm not going to say anything. That, that was Bathsheba. So those are the four that are highlighted there. Those are the four that are underscored there. I just think that's really incredible. Now, if we go over to Luke chapter 3, Luke 3. Tell your neighbor the boring part's going to be over soon. And say this isn't boring. Luke 3, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Now look at this, as was supposed, you like this? As was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, Heli, however you want to say that. So that tells us something in that verse alone, that tells us something, because Joseph is not the son of Heli or Heli. That's, that's not his father, that's not Joseph's father. That's actually Mary's father. But it's going through the legal lineage once again. Because women don't count. How many of you know that? None of us. I can't go home today if I believe that. Amen. But according to the legal, the, the way it was back then, and that's what it's saying, as was supposed, but this is God saying, look what I've slipped in here. And so in the next, uh, you know, 20 verses or so, we come to verse 38 and Luke 3, verse 38. And it, it's getting all the way, you know, it starts right there with Heli and it's going. And it gets all the way to verse 38 and sends. Actually, it looks like you're going backwards, but you're actually ascending. Um, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, I want to just tell you that Jesus can be traced back to Adam. That's pretty amazing. And ancestry.god, because Adam, which was the son of God. That's pretty amazing that you could take his lineage and you could trace him all the way back to God. Let me tell you something as a believer. 
your lineage can also be traced all the way back to God. And it needs no other name but yours. Matt, who was the son of God. God doesn't have grandchildren. He doesn't have great-grandchildren. He doesn't have stepchildren. He only has children. Amen? So we see this lineage, and this lineage is amazing also because there are 76 generations from Adam. From Adam, 76. There's those numbers again. Seven and six. How do they keep coming up? Seven and six. Incarnation. Hypostatic union. So we see this again in this lineage. But I want to take you right back to Matthew because there's something interesting, and there's so much interesting, and, and every year I want to bring this out but I, I feel like I lose my people, and I, I, so I want to keep it interesting. But I just love to just bring out different parts of this, and this is one of the favorite parts for me to bring out. And that's in Matthew 1 and verse 12, where it says, After they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias, that name's important, Jeconias begat Salathel, and Salathel begat Zerubbabel. <laughs> okay? Jeconias is who we're going to look at, Jeconias, and we're going to call this the curse of Kaniah. Say that with me, the curse of Kaniah, because take off the J, Kaniah, Jeconias. His name is also Kaniah in the Old Testament. It's also Jehoiakim. Uh, Jeremiah 22, Jeremiah 22, verse 24, tells us about the curse of of Kaniah. He was an evil king. He was so evil that God cursed him. That's right. God put a curse on him. The Bible said the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, there is a reason there's a curse. You earn curses. The curse causeless shall not come. So in Jeremiah 22 verse 24, God's saying this over Jeconiah. As I live, saith the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand. Now, I just brought a ring, and I didn't want to lose it. So here's the bit. I just brought a, a special ring here this morning. And he says, God said, if Kaniah were the signet, signet ring upon my right hand, Yet would I pluck thee thence. In other words, just like you could take a ring off, he said, I would pull you off of me. If you were the signet. Now, we know what the signet means. The signet is, is used. That it actually means these three words. To say these to somebody. In my name. That's what it means. A signet the father would give to his son. You know, the prodigal son came back. He got a robe. He got a ring. He got sandals. It means in my name. It's, it's, it's your credit. It's your debit card. It's everything. You could take that and go into town and, and stamp a seal. And whatever you want to buy, whatever you want to purchase, if the name is good on that signet, then the name is good for it. And it means in my name, in my name. In my name. Do you know that the children of God have a signet? That he has, he has put his seal upon us? Did you know that? I think it's Mark 16. He said, in my name, in my name, you will cast out devils. In my name, you will speak with new tongues. In my name, you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name, if you drink any deadly thing, it, it shall not prosper. In my name, in my name, that's the signet, in my name. And so God is saying to Jeconiah, or the curse of Kaniah, he's saying, if you were part of my name, I would pull you off and, and I would, look at this, I would throw you away. You guys just don't get that, leave it there, okay? I would throw you away. And then in the same chapter 22, verse 30 he goes back and reiterates a curse he has placed upon his life. Thus saith the Lord, write you this man childless. Now, now you've got to read this scripture careful. Because when we think childless, we think barren. In other words, he, he will not produce children. 
but that's not what he's saying. Write you this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper. In the same, in the same scripture where he says childless, in the same scripture he says not any of his children. Okay? So you've got to understand he's not saying that you would be barren or impotent. He's saying, but none of 